As you're getting ready to be seated, why don't you turn to somebody on to the right or left behind you, give them a high five, let them know you're glad to be in church with them today, and then you may be seated. You know, as you're being seated, not every song that we sing and introduce to our church uh, sticks. Sometimes we introduce a song. Uh, years ago, we sang Oceans. That, that's what that bridge is from, if you didn't know that. And a song just sticks in the season. I remember we sang No One Higher, and the rock won't move if you've been here for years. And so some songs stick. Sometimes some songs we sing for just a few weeks, and we never sing them again, and they don't, they, they don't work out with our church. But this, this song is, is special that we're singing uh, because our church is... is is in a season where we're growing, we're in a season where we're expanding, uh, and we're in a season where we're looking to, to reproduce healthy leaders and disciples of Jesus Christ, and really that's all about taking steps of obedience and listening to the voice of God and, 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 and you decreasing so that the Spirit of God can, can increase. And I feel like if there was going to be an anthem for this year, that this will be a song that we continually come back to. Maybe, maybe you're a worshiper during the week, and you should be listening to worship music uh, during the week, but may, maybe you begin to play that on your, on your own and in your car and just sing that over yourself. And maybe God is calling you to do something that you haven't wanted to do, but you know that he's calling and he won't stop calling. You ever notice that about God? Like he don't care about call waiting. He doesn't care if you ignore his calls. He just keeps asking until if you finally say, no, he's not going to change his mind. He's going to wait for you to change your ways. And so uh, this, is, this is, to me, a good lead leading into our message today. If you are not a normal church person, uh, we are in the middle of a message series, and so we'll talk for the next 35 or 40 minutes, and we'll get you out of here. And we called our sermon series a few weeks ago, What to Expect uh, When You're I Expecting. Uh, and it's not about having a baby, it's about starting another, another church. So we are, we are literally, uh, next week, we got our occupancy permit last week, and so we will have a group of people in their meeting next week and going, kind of checking out the streaming stuff. And then the first week in April, we will be one church that's meeting in, in five locations. And because of that, uh, we wanted to get you prepared, uh, but it's not final. Like, this is just the beginning. We're going to start another campus in a few years and another campus and another church, and we're going to continue to go uh, until God comes back, until he sends his son back and ends this, this thing we call earth. And so uh, we are in an exciting time, but we also wanted to get you prepared. So what I did a few weeks ago, I said, let's talk about why we reproduce, uh, and then let me talk to you about why churches don't. Let me give you some restrictions on reproduction. And then I told you last week, I said, now I want to give you some responsibilities. We are going to be a reproducing church. We are going to give energy. We're going to give time. We are going to care about lost people. That's what we are called to do. We, we will seek and save the lost. That's what Jesus told us to do. We will exist for those not yet here for the remainder of the history of our church. And so last week I said, let me give you some responsibilities. The first responsibility is we are going to create a safe place for people. That, that it's okay if you've done some really awful things. It's okay if you're not okay. It's okay if you don't understand everything that's going on here today. It's okay if you just want to come in here and sit and drink a cup of coffee and observe. We are okay with you being here. We want you to be here. We are a church that welcomes you. Uh, we want to make sure you feel comfortable from the moment you get here. We, this is a safe place for people to, to, to come. And so uh, we want to take a look next week at the topic of how we're going to be called and required to recreate ourselves. And so I don't know if you knew this, but, but we will reproduce who we are. We might have a bunch of set values and, and core beliefs and all these things, but you reproduce who you are. I don't know if you have kids. We've been talking a lot about babies and families and applying it, but I don't know if you've ever had a younger child and they say something, do something that you know you didn't teach them and you don't think they saw on TV. And what do you do oftentimes? You go, which one of you older siblings taught them that bad word? It wasn't me. I'm a pastor, right? Like I didn't, didn't hear that from me. Which one of you, which one of you told them that, that naughty word? Which one of you told them how to make that sound with their mouth, that fart sound, that obnoxious one? Which one of you is ruining my kid? And so we're going to talk about how we have a responsibility to replicate our, our, ourselves. We have a responsibility. And then next week after that, I'm going to talk to you about what it feels like to stretch as a church, that, that when, when you have a baby, that often things change, that that's what happens, that, that relationships change, that, that, that uh, time changes, that responsibilities change. And so we're going to take a look at what that looks like, because I know in church, oftentimes, uh, when you're in a growing church that likes each other, that the natural inclination is want to stay together, to want to, want to be together, want to be in the same room, want to be hanging out together, want to be in the same group. But oftentimes what happens is that becomes an inclusive club. And so what I've noticed in the 10 years of doing Journey Church is God is constantly taking people that I really like doing church with and relocating them. 
And I have to be okay with it because God is in the business of expanding his kingdom, not making me comfortable and making this the most enjoyable thing that you could ever do. If, if, if that was what he was in the business of doing, honestly, I don't think we would be, in, be pastors or be in the ministry because most of what we do is not that enjoyable. And so he is in the business of expanding his kingdom and reaching people far from God. And so I love that song we sang today because it, it leads right into the topic of what we're going to talk about. I, I want to talk to you on the topic of maturity today. Uh, the title of my message is another responsibility for us as a church that are here is, is we can't be high maintenance. Everybody look at your neighbor and say, don't be high maintenance. If you have a wife, you might want to just look forward. <laughs> you know, there's things I ask you to say that's a test. That's, that's the test. You don't say that to your wife. And so some of you are like, it's not me. It's my husband. He takes longer than me to get ready in the morning. He's actually the high maintenance one. I, I get it. I'm kind of high High maintenance. And so I want to talk to you on the topic of being high maintenance. And here's something I want you to remember today. Uh, the opposite of high maintenance is maturity. The opposite of becoming, uh, of, of high maintenance is becoming a, what I would call a mature person, physically, emotionally, and, and spiritually. Let me kind of give you kind of where, where this happened. When you have uh, multiple kids, the first kid you have, you give absolutely all of your time to, right? Like, Every moment, every need that they have, every itch that they have, everything that they need. You, you have, you, if, you're in a, if you're married, you have a, a spouse, it's two-on-one, but even if you're not, it's one-to-one -one most of the time. Like you, you, are, you are able to meet every need. The problem becomes when you add more to the equation. You add your second one, and eventually the conversation comes. There's this transition where you say, listen, stuff's changing. Like maybe, maybe they're only two years old at that point, and they don't fully understand it. But maybe you waited a few years, and they're four or five, and you're going, hey, stuff is going to change with us. Like you're not going to have um, all the time with mommy and daddy, and it's not going to be all eyes on you. You ever bring, remember that transition when you brought your, 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 your second baby home when your first kid, they, they literally would spin around and do jumping jacks, and they were like, everybody needs to keep looking at me, right? Like keep watching me because they were so used to having all eyes on them. But the more kids you have, the more of a transition they have to go through. The more of, of a understanding where, hey, stuff's going to continue to change. Not only are you going to, it's going to change, but your responsibilities, your requirements are going to change. Like we're not always going to be able to meet your every need at the moment that you want it. Like we're going to have a newborn baby and there's going to be times where they need change and they need this and you're going to have to figure some stuff out on your own. You're going to have to learn how to start making a, maybe, maybe your lunch for school. Maybe you're seven, eight, nine years old, learning to do wash, learning to be responsible. There's this transition. And the reason there's this transition is you have to get them to continue to move or they will get in the way. That, that's what will happen. Like they, you won't be able to give the attention to your, your youngest, the same attention, by the way, that you gave to them, but they don't know that, right? You ever have a little older, you're like, why does he get to do that? And they're like, you did that as well. Like what, I have, the conversation now is I have a five-year-old, 11-year-old, and my 11-year-old, I'm like, I'm like, clean up after your five-year-old. He's learning how to do it, but even when he tries to clean up, he just makes a bigger mess. And so can you just clean up? And he's like, why doesn't he have to help? And I'm like, because he's five. He's helping when he just gets up, right? Like he is learning, but you are 11. When you were five, you didn't do anything either, Like right? You didn't do much. You were kind of irresponsible. You kind of made a mess, but now you're 11. I need you to help so that our house can continue to function. And this same conversation is kind of like what I want to have with you today. When, when there's a season of transition, when we're, when we're pregnant, when we're going to have more babies, when we're going to invite more people into this church, and they're going to come in, and it's a very natural thing for people to come and be spiritual babies and be very needy and, and have lots of questions and have lots of concerns and make lots of mistakes and not know what's right and not know what's wrong. And that's a very uh, normal thing. Uh, immaturity is normal when you're young, but for some of you, you've been here for years. And at this point, it's just getting weird. Like, they just, like, just think about it. One time I watched this show. It was about weird, like, habits people had. And it was this 50-year-old man. I don't, he might have been, I don't know how old he was. Uh, and the habit that he, he had was he was a very normal, high-functioning person in society when he went out of his house. But as soon as he got home from work at nighttime and he came and he was a married man with no kids, he would take all of his clothes off and get dressed up like a baby. On TV, he would put a, a diaper on. He went to the bathroom in diapers. He would put a pacifier in. He would get in a crib. His wife would give him a very real thing. I remember watching and going, this is, this is creepy. <laughs> like, it wasn't like I was like, oh, that's cute, right? And there's not one person in this room going, no, no, that's kind of cute. Like, I want a husband like that. No, you're all going, no, that is disgusting. He's crapping in a diaper. He's 30, 50 years old. That's grotto. We don't even look at my two-year-old's crap in the diaper, right? Like, that's disgusting. And we're going, that's weird spiritually, that happens all the time in church. Spiritually, there's people who have been in church for a long time, 
yet they, they never grow up. We, we know this is true. It's very normal to start like this. Watch what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13. He says, when I was a child, what does he say? I talk like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. And then I became a man. Then, then I grew up. And the natural thing is when you grow up is you no longer talk like a baby. What do you say? I put the ways of childhood behind me. In other words, there's this cycle that's supposed to happen physically, but also supposed to happen spiritually. What is it? When you're, when you're an infant, when you're a toddler, all of your needs are met. You're not responsible for anything. Then you be going to adolescence. Maybe you're 9, 10, 11, 12, teenager years. You begin to transfer. They're not completely responsible for themselves. Thank God, right? But they're kind of responsible, responsible to make a lunch, responsible to do their wash, responsible to know, know when to do homework, responsible to get a job, responsible, to get, maybe you give them a car someday, they get responsible for that, they, have, they, they pay their insurance, they begin to have responsibilities, and here's the hope, so that one day they go to adulthood, and adulthood, let's just be honest, like 19, 20, 21 years old in our culture, 35 <laughs> but in my day and age, it was like 18, 19, 20 years old, okay, you're an adult, right, and it was, it was like, Hey, now it's time for you to be even more responsible. Doesn't mean my parents never helped me. I remember when they helped me at my first house, buy my first uh, outdoor set, and went to, went to Walmart and they bought that for me. And then one time they bought me a refrigerator. It's not like they went, "You're dead to me," but they want to be responsible. Now I was a, almost a forty-year-old. It's not like they're calling me up saying, "Hey, son, you all right?" Like that's a curse, by the way. Mom, Dad, I borrow a few bucks from you again. I'll pay you back. Never, right? Like we're getting to the point where stuff's beginning to transfer. And the reason is because when I was a baby, they began this process. They didn't say, hey, this is going to happen naturally. Because here's what we think oftentimes. Age equals maturity. How many of y'all know that's not true? <laughs> I have a friend, grew up with them. I remember he was an idiot in high school. Then I went away. I moved back. He was an idiot when he was an adult. He had an affair on his wife. He ended up losing his kids. I called him years later thinking, man, maybe he won't be an idiot anymore. He was in the room of somebody that he didn't even know, didn't talk to his kids. His wife was long gone, called him up, expected this man to be all grown up and mature and broken. He was still an idiot. Because, listen, maturity doesn't come with age. Maturity is optional. But it's also essential. It's optional, but it's also essential because here's what happens. I don't know if you've ever been around the people that have multiple kids. And look at that one kid, and they're like, he right there, that was my birth control. Like that one right there, he's the reason I went and got fixed. Like all of you have a kid like that. Like you're like, that one? Like I have three. Harrison, I remember for years we thought about it, and I'd be like, nope. Nope, like on the best days, you're like, yeah, we could probably do this again. Look, he's so cute. But on the majority of days, you're like, nah, like literally, he's awesome, and I'm glad I have him, but he's all that I can handle. He is all the kid that my house can handle, right? And so I look at him, and I'll say, he's it. I need to go get fixed. He is the, the reason, right? Like, he is, refer me to a doctor. I need, I need to, like, go. He's the reason, right? And I think church, churches do this. I think pastors go, like, you know, I want to reproduce, but, like, these people, they're the reason I can't. Like, they've been here for years. They don't really give. They don't really serve. They just come and take. And, like, I want to reproduce, and I want to add new babies, but I got to be honest with you, I don't have any time. Because even when I try to focus on the lost people, I got the same people calling me up, telling me about all their problems that they're supposed to have already handled because they're a new creation in Jesus Christ and they have faith and they have trust and they have obedience. And I got to be honest with you, most of the time in churches like that, the problem is not that God is not moving. The problem is that they are disobedient and the pastor refuses to tell them. And I'll tell you here, I'm not going to deal with you. <laughs> no, I'm not going to counsel you. Why? Because you're not going to listen and I don't get paid to talk to you, right? Let me go pay somebody $85 an hour and they can listen to your bullcrap. You just do what you're supposed to do and then we'll talk. Never happens in church, by the way. That's just a little tangent. <laughs> a little second service tangent, right? And so what I want to do is I want to, I want to show you what it looks like to transition. Nobody's, everybody's in this room is not mature. Let's be honest. I mean, I'm 39. It's questionable. But I want to show you what it looks like to be maturing. To, to be grown, just people coming in that are babies, what does it look like for the church to come and start to transition? What does it look like for those who have been here for a long time? In fact, uh, we're encouraging Hebrews chapter 6, verse number 6, two verses down, I didn't read the other one, where it says, therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be what? Be taken forward towards maturity. Let's move towards maturity. The other verse I had, I don't have time to read it, in Hebrews 6 says, by now you should be teaching, but you still need milk. 
Like you've been here long enough to be teaching. Like when somebody gets saved, we should be calling you and saying, hey, let us link this person up with you or with your family so they can watch how you live and learn what you, how you talk and learn how you act and follow you to become a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. By now you should be there, but many of you still need milk. Let us make the effort to move forward towards maturity. Why? It's essential. It's making room for new people. Let's not be the, the kid that stops the growth. Let's not be the ones that are in the way of God bringing new babies to this, to this church, people who can make messes. Let me, let, me give you, let me give you four what I would call transitions to maturity, just really quickly. This is what it looks like to transition from immature to mature spiritually. Number one is this. It is, there's, a, there's a transition from being fed to feeding yourself. From, from being fed uh, to what I would call feeding y- yourself. When you have a baby, they don't feed themselves, obviously. They come out and they need you to tell them when to eat. They cry when they're hungry, but they don't really know what to do with that. They need you to feed them a bottle. They, 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 they need you as they get older to feed them baby food. They need you, even when they're in six, seven, eight months old, you put them in a, in a chair and they need you to cut everything up and blow it all, blow on it and give it to them at perfect lukewarm temperature and, and make sure the bites are, are small. And, and when you first come into this world, Everybody is responsible to feed you. You're not, you're not going around saying, what am I going to eat? You know your parents, if you have high-functioning parents, they already have your day planned out. They have your meals planned out. They pack your bag in the morning. They get two peaches. They get a carrot. They mix them together so they can hide the carrots, right? Like, that's what they do. Like, that's a parenting secret. You have the formula. You have the, the, the breast milk. Whatever you do, like, you have everything ready for your baby before the baby. They don't have to worry about All they got to do is be hungry. They get fed. And oftentimes, this is the same attitude we come to church with. When you're, when you're a new believer, you come to church and you need somebody to feed you. You need somebody to tell you, uh, explain to you the Bible. You need somebody to explain to you the presence of God. You need to, somebody to explain to you maybe the character of God. You, you, you need somebody to share the principles of, of, of Scripture. You need somebody to introduce you. You don't know what's healthy. Like there's a season in your kid's life, even when they get older, that they don't know what's healthy. They don't know what's good for them. They don't know what's bad for them. Like if you let my kids choose, they're going to eat chips every day. Like what's the snack? Chips. They're going to eat chicken nuggets, and they're going to eat pizza, and now we're in the McDonald's season. And so I told you before, McDonald's is good. It's fake news that people say it's bad. And so like, they're in the McDonald's season, and, and we're, we're eating like this, and they would, just, they would eat that. If you said, what, what do you want to drink? They would drink Dr. Pepper every day. Like, they would never, there's not a time they would choose water. Like, I get it. Like, my responsibility as a parent is to be like, that's your third glass of Dr. Pepper this morning. It's 7 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> you probably shouldn't do that. Your mom's going to know, right? Like, no, you, sometimes you have to eat eggs instead of Pop-Tarts, and sometimes you need to eat, you know, your mom's Brussels sprouts instead of French fries, and like, like, we're still teaching them, even at 11 years old, and I get it, there's a transition, because hopefully one day that my sons get to the age where they realize you have to make wise choices, you are what you eat. So you have to make wise choices, and then you have to feed yourself, and nobody's going to be in your dormitory room someday or in your apartment saying, okay, open wide, Here comes the airplane. And even you, I mean, think about it. Think about it as we, we open this up. If you had a normal life this week and, and, and you have a normal house and you have food, most of us have food, and you have a job and even the ability to go out to eat and like all week you, you could have ate and you, you, you know, some could have prepared something for yourself. And this is what we do with church all the times is like you coming here today and being like, man, I'm starving. Oh, man, you didn't have any money this week? No, no, I got a refrigerator full of Audi's groceries. Yeah, well, why didn't you eat? What? Nobody, nobody, nobody told me to. No, nobody told me to eat. And, and on top of that, last Sunday, I went to Shady Maple. After you were done preaching, you preached a long message, Pastor. I went to Shady Maple. And I ate, and I never ate again the rest of the week. And I was shocked that by Monday night going into Tuesday, I was starving again. And I went to Shady Maple, and I called them up, and I, I said, hey, listen, you need to give me back my money because your meal did not fill me up past a day. And they go, you're an idiot. That meal was a great experience, but that meal was not supposed to feed you for the rest of, of the week. And I would say, think about that with church. It's okay to come here and say, God, I want you to do something in my life. And I, and I want to be, be fed, and, I, and I, I'm looking for the word of God, and I'm looking for the presence of God. I think we should come with that expectation. But if this is the only time you're eating during the week spiritually, you're going to starve. 
See, this is what I would call a Catholic mentality. And just so you're aware, we are not a Catholic church. We are a Protestant church. The word Protestant means protest. It means we are not for the Catholic church. We don't believe like they believe. We don't think like they think. We don't teach what they teach. We are not Catholic. We are as far away from Catholic as a Dallas Cowboys fan is from an Eagles fan, right? We believe in different gods. We pray differently. We have different expectations. And we put a different weight on the people that stand on the stage. Because in the Catholic church, the message is you come to church and the guy that's standing up in the front, that's speaking a language that you don't even understand, that you just now know because you've heard it repeated for the last 15 years of of your life, that you need him to tell you how to get back to God and how to communicate God. When the Bible says in Hebrews that you you shouldn't call anybody a priest, you have one high priest, his name is Jesus. That I am not raising up a Catholic church where you need me to feed you and grow you and push you. That that might happen in the beginning, but eventually I want to teach you how to feed yourself. You ever hear the statement, teach a man to, to, to uh, give a man a fish and you do what? Feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish and you do what? Feed him for his life. I, I, I want to teach you how to feed yourself. I want to teach you how to how to push into the word of God. I want to teach you scriptures like this. Watch what it says in the Bible in Luke 11. It says, so I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Can you can, does it say, go to your pastor and ask him and he will give it to you? Go to your church and ask them, what, ask and it will be given to you. Right? Watch what it says, seek and you will find. That's your responsibility. Knock and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, the door will be open. Whose responsibility is it to feed you? You. We'll teach you. I'm going to teach you how to feed yourself. I'm going to teach you how to cook for yourself. It's like my son. The other day I came downstairs. We have one bathroom in our house right now that is functioning because we started to rip apart another bathroom because it was leaking. Whole another story. So we have one bathroom in our house right now. And the morning happened. It takes even longer to get ready in the morning. And so everybody's kind of scattered around. I come downstairs. He's ready. He's been ready for, for hours. It feels like he's down in front of the TV. He hasn't eaten yet. I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm waiting for you to come cook me, cook me something. I said, you're 11. There's Pop-Tarts, there's a toaster, make it happen. Don't tell your mom you're eating that, by the way, but make it happen. And I think oftentimes that's how we are. We're waiting around for somebody to feed us, somebody to give us some gold nugget, somebody to encourage us into our next step of obedience, somebody to empower us. When we have all of that opportunity right in front of us, the Holy Spirit says, come to me, knock, ask, seek, and you will find. And so you go from a church that is constantly seeking to be fed to a church that is learning how to feed themselves. Christians leave the church oftentimes. And what do they say? I left that church because I'm not being what? That's garbage. That's, I, left, I left Shady Maple because I didn't get enough food. That's your problem, not Shady Maple's problem. Go from being fed to feeding yourself. Let me just give you quickly three more. That, that one was my number one most important one I wanted you to get. Number two is this, is there's a transition from what I will call the, 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 the high chair to the stool. The high chair to, to the stool. What's the high chair? High chair is a spot you pick your baby up or your toddler, stick them in, strap them in, bubble wrap them, right? Feed them every bite. It's, it's actually a different chair set apart from the normal table. The message is that's the throne, I'm going to feed that. You're like, it's all about you. Here's, here's the thing. There's a transition that happens in every family, right? You don't just keep adding height chairs to your, to your house. You don't have an 11-year-old. You're like, hey, squeeze in. Suck in. We're going to stick you in this Ikea height chair. Can't afford other ones. This one's $11.99. It's fine. We're going to put you in this Ikea. Then you have another one. You put them in the height. Like, eventually, you're moving them. What are you moving them? You're moving them to a booster seat, and then eventually, for the glory of God, you're moving them to a normal seat. It's one of the greatest moments in your life when you go to a restaurant. They say you need a height chair. Nope. Need a booster seat? No, I'm just normal. They don't look normal, but we are just a normal family. We need a normal seating arrangement, right? Normal seats, right? I, I think there's this transition that needs to happen in our churches oftentimes where you transition from what I would call the, the, the high chair spiritually to the stool. The high chair is the same mentality. What's the mentality? Serve me. Today I'm here to be served. I'm going to be part. I'm going to be ushered in. I'm going to get a cup of hot coffee that somebody made for me, even though they lost the same hour of sleep that I lost. Somebody's going to watch my kids. What do you have for me? What are you preaching on? What are you not preaching on? I don't like this. I want a different sermon series. Are you preaching on dating? Because I need a relationship. Like everything, it's a height chair mentality. Sit me in, feed me. Cut it up into small bites. Don't talk too long. Don't talk too short. Play my song I like. Second week we played that song in a row, you better not play the third week. 
We're going to play it till you get it, by the way. And what you have is this interaction with the church where it's basically somebody sets you in your seat and you, you sit there, and it's fine in the beginning. But eventually, there needs to be a transition to what I would call the stool. You need to go away from the serve me mentality, and you need to develop the same mentality Jesus developed, which is serve others. You see it in John chapter, chapter 13, where Jesus is having what we call the Last Supper, and um, his disciples are there, and he's about to teach them communion. And at one point, I think this is amazing, he knows Judas is going to betray him, yet he's still interacting with them. And I don't even know how you do that. I have a hard time with that myself, but he's Jesus, so he's showing us you can overlook offenses. And then he begins to wash these disciples' feet. These are the same guys he knows are going to betray him and abandon him, and he's washing their feet. And they begin to flip out, and here's why they begin to flip out, because it's a gross job. And nobody that was in a place of honor, a host of a party, never washed people's feet, ever. But the roads were gross. The animals were, were, were gross. It wasn't like they had little donkey parks and camel parks where you could go and they would take a dump and you would bag it up and carry it with you. Like, they just went. And so people walk through these dirty roads and, 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 and animal feces and just disgusting things. And then they would get to mealtime and it was pretty common practice. Stuff smelled, let's wash feet. But the host never did it. He would call his servant. And it wasn't just... Just a servant, it was a non-Jewish servant, because even the Jewish servant was above this. So this is why it's so ironic that Jesus begins to wash his disciples' feet. And as he begins to wash his disciples' feet, Peter freaks out. He says, you're not going to wash my feet. I'm going to wash your feet. He's Peter. And so Jesus washes their feet, and and, uh, it says in, in John 13, verse number 12, when he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you, they asked, he asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and that's what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet and have showed, you should wash one another's feet. I've set you an example that you should do as I have done. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master. I wonder, I wonder if you're in the right spot today. He says, no servant is greater than his master, nor a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. And that word blessed actually means happy, content, joy-filled, peace-filled. I think it's amazing because a lot of you don't have any peace, no joy. You're a Christian. You don't have the very things that the Holy Spirit says he's going to give you. So then I'll question if you're really a Christian. But if you are a Christian, you're supposed to have joy and love and peace and patience and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control and all those things. Those are the fruit of, of the Holy Spirit. And a lot of you don't have those. And the reason a lot of you don't have those is because you've never stepped out of the height chair to the stool. You've never taken the same position that Jesus took in this moment. He said, you know what, I'm going to move my life to a position of, of serving. Maturity looks like serving. It doesn't look like scripture memory. There's so many people I met, they know so much Bible. I'm like, who cares? You think anybody in the world cares that you know Micah? You don't even know who Micah was. Lamentations. Leviticus. Woo. You know all that scripture. You don't serve nobody. I know, but my job is to memorize scripture and tell people what it says. Where? Because Jesus, at the end of his life, said, let me show you something. I'm not going to quote Leviticus to you. I'm not going to quote Psalms to you. I'm not going to quote myself. I'm going to show you what it looks like to get out of the height chair and assume the position of the person in the stool. I'm going to move from the height chair to the stool. Let me just give you two more real quick. I I think maturity looks like this. You transition from making messes to making stuff easier. Can Can I just be frank with you? There are a lot of people in this church that make messes. You come on Sunday, you don't serve, you sit in a seat that somebody straightened out for you, you leave your Wawa coffee on the floor, you think it's going to get miraculously going to get legs and walk itself to the trash can. Somebody parks you, somebody watches your kid, you can't even stand your own kid, you drop them off, right? You're like, here, take this, take this for me. I'm not going to watch kids. I deal with kids all week. Like somebody does that for you, and literally when you leave, this place is not any better. It's worse. More stuff is broken, more toilets are clogged, more candy is, is being consumed, more handprints are on the wall from, from our kids. Like more is done, more damage is done, which is a sign, by the way, of a toddler. Do they clean up or do they make messes? Oh my gosh, from the moment they get up to the moment they go to sleep, it looks like a bomb goes off in your house. I remember in my first house, we had three stories, and every story had a basket of toys on it so that we could keep them entertained. And there was, there was days that before I believed they could even get up and down the steps by crawling, that somehow those toys would be everywhere. It was like magic, right? Everywhere they went got worse so, until a couple weeks ago, and they still make messes. Let's be honest. They're 11, 9, and, and 5. They make messes by looking at things. 
but they're starting to change. A few Fridays ago, it snowed, and I went out to, to shovel. My two boys were at, at, the, at, at school, and I'm shoveling and doing my driveway, and then I have an older neighbor, and so, you know, I, I feel like I'm a pastor, and the Bible says, love your neighbor as you love yourself, and if there was a camera on me, I think I would probably do it if people were watching, and so even though I don't want to, I've been shoveling his driveway and my driveway when, when I have time, and and uh, even if I don't have time, that's a horrible excuse, by the way, and so that sounded ridiculous, but I've been shoveling his driveway, and so I'm out there, I'm like, I gotta do this, I'm shoveling, I can't believe I'm shoveling, because it's March, it's not supposed to snow in March, this is satanic, and so I'm shoveling, and my five-year-old comes out in his snow stuff, and I'm like, here we go, now he's gonna get in the way, and he runs up to me, he says, he says, I'm gonna help. I said, you're gonna what? And we spent the next hour, because when you let a little toddler help you, it means it's going to take you twice as long. And we took turns shoveling our neighbor's driveway. And as we took turns, one time, at one point I stepped back, and I just had visions in my head. And the visions I had in my head were me on a, on a lawn chair on my deck, watching them mow, and watching my boys mulch, and watching, watch and like finally it paying off all this work and all this investment, and they're going to help an old man out. And I was super excited because I'm like, they're going to get to the point where they are no longer be, going to be the ones that create messes, but they are actually going to make my life easier. Like, this is amazing. This is biblical. This is Jesus. <laughs> and when I say that, I'm kind of playing around, but I'm kind of serious. Think about it. Wherever Jesus went, stuff got better. Ever. Shows up, Peter's fishing. He ain't got no fish. He said, throw, the, throw that on the other side. He can't even pull the load in. Goes to a wedding. They don't got no wine. He makes more wine. He's Jesus. He goes and he preaches to a crowd of 5,000 people, which is actually more than that because it says 5,000 men and women and children did not get counted, so it could have been up to 20,000 people at that point. And they are hungry. They are hangry at this point. He has preached too long. And the Bible says he makes food for all of them, and there's 11 baskets or 12 baskets left over. Like everywhere he went, he makes stuff better. Like when we say at Journey Church, we are what? We are a blessing, not a what? That's just being Jesus. Like maturing churches, everywhere they go, stuff just gets better. So you go from making messes. Listen, when you're a new believer, when you're new to church, I get it. But that process should happen pretty quickly. Like if you've been here for three years and you are still in the making mess business, it's time to grow up. Somebody else served today. Somebody else showed up. Somebody else taught your kids. Somebody else who is just as busy as you has done what maybe you need to do now so that somebody new that's still not yet here can come in and sit in the seat that you are currently occupying. It's time to move. It's time to grow up. Number four, lastly, I think that, that you need to understand that, that in maturing churches, that people are going from what I would call incredibly moody to increasingly committed. If, if there was one thing that babies and toddlers have, it's that they are stinking moody little creatures. Like, you, you, you have a toddler? You ever put them to bed? They are sweet as can be. They are kissing you. You're reading a story to them. You're reading the Bible to them. They're getting it. You wake them up the next morning. It's like you're waking up Satan. <laughs> their breath is bad. Their hair is sticking up. You know, the dude on their shirt, the incredible guy is now, he looks like a demon, right? You're like, what is wrong with you? And they're moody. Like, it, you can, your kid can ask you for something. By the time you get it to them, they don't want it anymore. Because you didn't get it to them fast enough because they're not only moody, they're really impatient. They don't want it. You don't get to me when I want it. And I, and I think that this is a great way to end this because this is also a sign of spiritual immaturity. Impatience, never being committed, a little bit of uh, character issues, integrity issues. These... these, these these manifest themselves in immature followers of Christ. And it's very normal when you're a new believer. People come, they get saved, super exciting. Like I, I, I've had a time, somebody gets saved, they get baptized, and then they relapse. Or they're super excited to serve, and they, they go away, you don't see them for months on a time. And then they come back for a couple months, and what, they're immature. Like they're, they're, they're growing, they're learning to be consistent, they're learning to be committed. But I'm always confused. Then you see people who have been coming to church for years, and they're still just as inconsistent as they ever were. They're still just as moody. They're still just as hot and cold. And for me, I want you to understand that when you become a mature follower of Christ, it's not that you are just right away fully committed. It's that your commitment continues to, to increase. Watch what Paul says in Ephesians 4. And this is why I love these, these passages. And this is why it talks about it so much in the, in the New Testament. It's because Paul was starting new churches and he knew what it was like. 
So he's constantly talking to churches that need to mature, need to grow up, need to stay healthy, need to overcome issues. And this is what he says in Ephesians 4. He says, he says then you're going to get to the point where you no longer uh, be infants. Here's what it looks like to be an infant. You're tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. In other words, you're completely inconsistent. You're impatient. You're always up. You're always down. Always down. Years ago, I learned this, this what I would call uh, equation from a man named Pastor Craig Rochelle in his book called It. And he said, Here, here's what you need to do in your life if you want to see any type of God movement and moment in your life. He said, here's the equation. He said, consistency over time equals momentum. That's what maturity looks like. Consistency over time. You don't change overnight. You want to you lose weight? You go to Planet Fitness on Monday, you're not going to lose weight. You're just going to be sore. In fact, you go for the next month, probably not a lot going to happen. You might feel better, but no one is going to be able to tell, but five, six, seven months down the line, all of a sudden, consistency over time equals momentum. You want to fix your marriage? You can't come to one marriage counseling class. It's consistency over time. You want to become who God has called you to become. Consistency over time equals momentum. We're going to become increasingly committed instead of incredibly moody people. We're going to go from making messes to making stuff easier. Making messes to making stuff easier. We're going to go from the high chair to the stool. and We're going to go from the expectation of somebody feed me. I'm going to learn how to feed myself. Why? Because God wants to do something with you. God wants to do something with your life. God wants you to be a leader. God wants you to lead people the way that Paul and Peter and any other great biblical character you can think about, the way they led people. They weren't different people. They were more committed people. God wants to do something in and through our church, but it comes through the process of maturity. Would you just bow your heads and would you close your eyes with me just for a second? And I, this message is, is significant for us as a church because, man, I don't want us to get in the way. We used to say at Journey a long time ago, we would say one of our core values is we need your seat. Because that seat represents the opportunity for the Holy Spirit to move in a new believer's life and somebody who doesn't yet know Christ and change them. But somebody can't sit in that seat if you are always occupying it. It doesn't mean you don't ever sit in a seat and worship, but what it means is you are aware that your role, your job, your responsibility is greater than that. See, we are about to stretch our church. We are about to expand. We are about to watch people walk from the campus that they're comfortable in to, to a campus that's brand new to, to start a new work. And when, when that happens, it creates a, a space, a vacuum where other people need to fill in, where other people need to step up. And here's what I would say to you. Some of you are here in this environment because of the sacrifice and service of somebody else. And it's good that you're here, but you've been here for years. And so it's time to mature. It's time to transition. It's time to get out of the height chair, take the stool. It's time to stop coming here asking somebody to feed you every week and learn to pursue the presence of God on your own. Doesn't mean the meal won't be good on Sunday, but it means it's not going to sustain you Monday through Saturday. You need the presence and power of God in your life, and so you're going to learn to feed yourself, to seek the face of God, to get into your prayer closet, the Bible says where what you do in secret, God will reward in public. I'm going to transition. Transition for making messes. For putting a burden on areas. I'm going to make stuff easier. Everywhere I go, I'm going to transition. I'm going to grow in, in my faith. I'm going to become increasingly committed to what God wants to do. That is a sign of maturity. Commitment. Commitment. Passion will get you married. Commitment will keep you married. Excitement and passion may make you respond to the gospel message. Commitment will keep you going. It's commitment that shows signs of maturity. It's the ability to stay when others go. It's the ability to keep pushing when it would be easier to quit. It's commitment. So we're going to mature our church. We're going to make room for new people. That's what we're doing. We're going to seek and save the lost. And as we pray today, and ask the Spirit to move. That's what we do here at the end. We just ask the Holy Spirit to begin to do a work in each of our lives. I believe when we come here today that, that every time we gather that somebody comes to Journey Church that doesn't yet have a relationship with God. 
And I don't want to take hours to explain it to you because even if I did, you maybe fully wouldn't comprehend it. But I want you to hear me that this is not a religious place, that sometimes, sometimes church gets lumped in with religion. Because religion says that we are a people that are trying to please God. We are a people that are trying to behave and trying to do the right thing. And if we do those things that God, our creator, may take us back, but that's not what we are here. We are a, a broken people. We are a lost people. We are a sinful people. We are a people with the past. We are a people that have made messes of our lives. And we've come to the face of God, the presence of God. And it's there we met him in forgiveness through his son, Jesus Christ. And so when I say that we're a church, you need to understand that we are a church and the church is messed up of grace-filled people. And that same God that loved me and that same God that loved many of you, that God, that God loves you today. Loves you more than you can imagine. His plans for you are bigger than anything you can comprehend. I feel like somebody needs to hear this, that you are not an accident. That you are not a waste you are not a mistake. You're not as the result of somebody's one night stand or drunken escapade, whatever other way that you got here, that the hand of God's been on you since the moment you were conceived, that his thoughts for you are greater than the number of sand on the shore, that he wo wove you together in your mother's womb, and he loves you more than you can imagine. Here's how I know how much he loves you, that while you are still a sinner, and you are a sinner, and I am a sinner. That the Bible says in Romans that Christ died for us. The wages of my sin should have been death in hell, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. For anyone who calls on the name of the Lord, they shall be saved. And I feel like there's somebody in this place that today is your time to call on the name of the Lord. Today is your moment. Today is the moment that you say yes to Jesus. I can't explain what's going on here in this moment. I don't even know what he's saying to you, but I know what the Bible says, that he begins to knock at the door of your heart in Montgomeryville, in Limerick, in Royersford, in Plymouth, in, in Plymouth Meeting, in Phoenixville, that he knocks at the door of your heart. If you would just let him in, if you would just invite him into your mess, invite him into your life, the Bible says that he'll come in, that he'll save you, that he'll set you free, that he'll forgive you, that he'll be a friend that sticks closer than a brother. That he will never leave you. That he will never turn his back on you. That he's not saving you because you're good. He's saving you because he's good. That he's giving you grace today and mercy and hope. That mercy, the Bible says, is a mercy that is new every morning. That even when you're faithless, that your God will still be faithful. So what do you do in this moment? It's simply a moment where you say yes. God is speaking to somebody here today. And you just say yes. And how we do that here? It's just with a simple, a simple recognition to God and, to, and to, to me that that's me by putting up your hand and say, hey, today I need to get my life right with Jesus Christ. Today I need to ask him into my life. Today I need to ask him to forgive my sins. Today, today I need to stop carrying the weight of the world on my shoulders. Today I want to be whole. Today I want to be healed. Today I want hope. Today I want Jesus. If that's you in this place or other campuses or somebody there that's going to let you let me know, and even in Montgomeryville, I know it could be awkward sitting there together in a, in a living room, but the presence of God is there right now. Even if you're online, we have somebody there ready to respond and you say, hey, pastor, that's me. This is my moment and a very real step of obedience. Today, I need to get my life right with Christ. I need to be spiritually reborn. I want to become all that he created me to be. I'm not a mistake. I have a purpose. I have a reason to be here. And I believe it starts with Jesus. If that's you all over our houses, in one big, bold step of faith, would you just shoot your hand up in the air, begin to shoot your hand up in the air in Phoenixville and in Royersford and Plymouth Meeting and Limerick and even right there in Montgomeryville. Right now, I'm going to give my life to Jesus Christ. We're going to give you one more second. We're not moving from this moment. I, was, I thought I was an accident. I thought I was a mistake. I, I thought my life was hopeless, but today I believe your word, and I want to receive Jesus as my Lord and my Savior. Church, would you begin to pray with me all over our houses as people continue to respond? Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you for all that you've done. 
thank you for all that you continue to do. Thank you for your word, for it never returns void. But not only did it challenge us as a church, did it stretch us as believers, did it push us forward in your call and in your will, but Lord, it also drew people to you. Lord, your spirit is here right now, and you are saving people for the first time. You're, you're somebody's renewing their commitment to you, maybe. And Lord, you're changing them from the inside out. Here's what we believe. One moment with you can change and is better than a thousand elsewhere. And Lord, you have been here. You have done what only you could do. And Lord, we are grateful to be a vessel that's been used by you. We're grateful for your, the ability to worship you, the ability to serve you, the ability to share your word. And Lord, we look expectantly into what you want to continue to do this week. Jesus, we've been honored to be with you. We're grateful for your presence, and we're thankful for your word. In Jesus' name that we pray. Everybody shout amen. Come on, let's clap for the person in Limerick that responded to the gospel. Somebody else in Royersford. Yes.